All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Get Your Mind Right podcast. This is your host, Mr. Mike, and this is episode number 21, if I'm not mistaken, episode number 21. I have another guest, another special guest. Um, without further ado, we have Ed Sanchez. What's up, brother? How you doing? What's up, Mr. Mike? Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Thanks. Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation, bro. So tell me, man, um, how you doing? Where do you Where do you stay at? Um, not doing not too bad, man. I, I I recently moved to Dallas. Well, I say recently, but uh, I uh, I'm originally from California. My work moved me out here about four years ago now. But I keep saying that I just recently moved out here, even though it's now been four years. But it seems like yesterday. Um, but yeah, my work has me out here. I work for Toyota. Um, I'm an engineering manager for Toyota, and I don't know if you knew, but uh, they had their headquarters out in Southern Cal for forever, for like decades, and then they recently moved us all out here. Okay. So that's where I'm at, man. Four years, you said? Yeah, getting used to it, but, you know, there's a lot of people moving into Dallas, dude. It's it's booming, so uh, people from California, from uh, from New York, uh, people from different different areas, so it's getting to be a little bit like a like a mini LA out here. That's cool, man. All the, yeah. All the movement. Yeah. A lot of people are moving out of Cali, man. Why do you think that is? Yeah. It's a lot of things, man. I mean, you know, you could, you could look at the politics behind it all. You could look at the, uh, I think that's a big part of it, man. The politics. Yeah. The politics, the, uh, so, you know, the, 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 there's a social aspect to it, you know, cost of living. Um, Very expensive. Yeah. And you talk, you know, the people who move from California that, that like it here, they say all the same things that everybody has heard about already, right? They say, you know, uh, California is like, they bring out the politics card, they, right? They say California is way too far left for them. They talk about crime. They talk about cost of living. Homelessness. Um, homelessness, yeah. But then you got the other crowd out here, the crowd that... Uh, moved out here from California for work or whatever, but they don't like it. They want to move back. And they say kind of the opposite, right? They say, you know, hey, California is very diverse. You know, we like to help people. Um, the cost of living is worth it, you know, for the atmosphere. I like to be by the beach. I like the mountains, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm right in the middle, you know, <laughs> but you're right in the middle. You, you, you hear you hear both sides of it. Uh, it. it it took me moving out of California and I've lived in several different States, but it took me moving out of California to get a different perspective of life, you know, and eventually become an adult. But that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing here is, is kind of both sides of, of, of the reasoning. That's interesting. You, you mentioned that, bro. Um, <clears throat> I've, 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 I was born in California and I've yeah. never lived anywhere besides Cali, man. So mm. some, sometimes I, I, I start thinking and I'm like, damn, how would I be or how would I change if I were to like live in a different state, in a different place in the world to say like, sometimes I ask myself that question. Sometimes I ask myself that question and ask myself, you know, do I need that? Do, do you feel yeah. like, do you feel like the relocation of where you live um, changes your perspective on, on life? For sure, 100%, man. And I mean, on that topic alone, we could probably talk for hours, but for sure, you know, um, for example, my first my first big move was when I, uh, I graduated college. I was 2004, and I moved to Utah. Um, from from Cali to Utah? Yeah, from Southern Cal to, to Utah. And, you know, that alone, you know, your mind starts wandering, right? Like, that's those are 180 degrees apart in every way. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, there goes, you know, skinny little me, fresh kid out of college going to somewhere that's completely out of my comfort zone. But I didn't know at the time I was very naive. Um, but it wasn't until I was in Salt Lake city for about uh, maybe about two months that I got settled in got into my job, uh, where I was going to live. I started meeting people and then, then it hit me, you know, I'm like, Hey, everybody here is is Mormon. Everybody here is super religious. Um, there aren't many Hispanics out here. Um, 
politically, they're completely different cultures. Um, everybody's married with kids and, you know, I'm still single at the time. And so my point is that it was such a different uh, environment than, than what I was used to at the time. Um, and it took, took a little bit of adjustment. Um, I was there for a few years, but eventually, you know, I kind of, that was my first real taste of adversity as an adult. I had, a, you know, I grew up with a lot of adversity, but that, that's a different topic. But as an adult, I thought, all right, this is very different, but I'm starting to realize that everything that I had heard in California about states such as Utah, it's really not true, man. When I was living there, um, you know, I wasn't trying to get recruited by Mormon cults like <laughs> some of the stuff you hear in the news and there wasn't, it wasn't the racism that, you know, you hear in the media. Um, but I also learned the opposite. You know, when I was in Utah, people would say a lot of things about California that me being from California, I knew for a fact they weren't true. But all of the only thing those people in Utah had to go off of was what they heard in the media, right? So I was in a little bit of a unique position at the time where there weren't many people moving in from California at the time, but I was one of the few. So I got that perspective of both sides, right? So I thought to myself, hmm, the media in California is telling me one thing, the media in Utah is telling me another thing. But now that I've spent some time here, the truth is actually somewhere in the middle. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 people are nicer than what I was told in both, in both sides. Right. Um, and so that was my real, my first taste of a move, creating a little bit of adversity for me and impacting my lifestyle back to your question. So now that I've moved, uh, because of my job to a few different regions of the country, um, I kind of embrace that, you know, cause I'm, I'm expecting, and it's been true every single move. I'm expecting to learn something new about myself, about people, about society, about politics. And, you know, fast forward to now, uh, 20 years later here in uh, Dallas, it's the same thing all over again. I'm learning something new, meeting new people, seeing a different side of things. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, you know, I, I'm so grateful for that, but I, I wouldn't have expected it, you know, unless I had it started to move, you know, to different regions of the country. So to answer your question, yeah, it definitely has impacted my viewpoint of things. I'm not so farsighted in my beliefs. Now I realize that, like I said earlier, at least to, to me in my mind, most things are somewhere in the middle, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know always, if that made sense, but no, yeah, absolutely. It does. Yeah. Have you always worked for Toyota? No, uh, when I finished college, I worked in uh, food manufacturing. <laughs> uh, I worked for Frito-Lay and then I worked for Nestle. Um, and I did that for about, uh, up, so I graduated in 2004. What, what, what was your degree? Uh, mechanical engineering. And then I got a minor in electrical. Um, and, and in school, I wanted to do a lot of robotics. So I had a concentration in robotics and programming and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, I was pretty naive and I didn't know that most engineers, once they graduate, like less than 10% of what they do in their career is actually what they studied. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm, I'm working in food manufacturing, uh, not necessarily dealing with the science behind food, but, you know, um, helping manufacturing plants uh, upgrade their equipment, design manufacturing lines, that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of, that was kind of my first taste of life as an adult out of college. Uh, and then, then I started realizing that when I got more mature, the product that Frito-Lay and Nestle made wasn't something I was passionate about. You know, I've always been kind of a healthy person. I had a healthy lifestyle. And even though I was never going to abuse uh, salty snacks, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, I, I always thought to myself, I don't want to be part of something that's promoting a health, an unhealthy lifestyle, right? Even, even though it's ultimately down to the person, but the, you're kind of promoting that by make pretty pushing out this, this product that's not necessarily good for you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I kind of decided to go back to something that was more true to my beliefs. And at that time I had a little bit more experience as an adult, knew the, the industries a little bit. I had a little bit of a more financial uh, backing myself saved up. So I said, okay, let me see if I can make a switch to something that's more, um, a little more fruitful to my core, you know? Right. Yeah. That that so, that's a anyway. tough one, man. It's a tough one. Um, 
it's hard to find, you know, jobs or things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say hard, but it's, it's a bit challenging to find things, you know, that you want to do that represent you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause no, nobody wants to do something or represent a brand or work at a job. Like you said, that doesn't really match their core beliefs. But I yeah. feel like sometimes, especially in the beginning, we have to kind of just work with what we got that, that, for example, me, me as a fighter, like, you know, I, I get help from, from sponsors, from, from a lot of people, you know, people who are close to me, people who see my hard work in, in, in the sport of boxing and they want to help me out. And I really don't care who that person is or what they represent or, you know, or, you know, they might have a business or whatnot. Um, I feel like the, just the, the wanting to help me out, that's enough for me to, you know, represent whatever their business is, you know, it's kind of more for like, sure. it's, it's kind of more like a relationship we have, you know, um, yeah. you, you, you see the, the opportunity, uh, like what it is, you know, what's an opportunity. It's, it's help, you know, we all need help. Um, yeah. not to 100%. say, not to say that the people helping me out is not, you know, what I'm like the people I want to have around me. I'm not trying to say that, but it's just that, you know, if someone wants to help you out, then, you know, why at the beginning, we know why not get the help? You know, you need all the help you want, you can get. Yeah. And, uh, you know, eventually as you start, um, mm, kind of discovering who you are, uh, and what you like and what you don't like, then that's when you have the choice for, to pick, you know, I want to work with yeah. this person. I want to work with, that business i want uh that person as a sponsor uh but at the beginning you ain't shit you know so you have to you exactly. have to ju yeah you ain't shit man like you we don't have yeah. we don't have like the fucking authority nor the name to fucking be choosing who we want to work with man like you you kind of have to be humble and be like okay like help is help you know if, yeah. if somebody's somebody's nice enough to to be willing to help me out at the beginning then why not you know exactly yeah yeah, that's not a bad thing either. You know, like you said, it's once you become a, a little more influential, more established, then th then you can pick and choose and kind of return the favor, right? Maybe you can choose some of the smaller sponsors who are willing to help you out. Um, of course, but they also if, of course, believe if that, something that you believe. If that loyalty is yeah. there, it's yeah. like, of course, man, like it doesn't have to. It's not even about the. Sometimes it's not even about the brand itself. It's that loyalty or that friendship, that relationship you guys might have created. Yeah, for sure. Um, and sometimes, you know, and sometimes you have to look out for yourself and, you know, your your brand as, a, as a, in my example, as a fighter. So you have to kind of know the difference, you know, like, like, like you said, you know, some people who, who helped you out at the beginning, then that's kind of more like a, like a loyalty relationship that was created. So I would of course, pay them back in the future when I do have a, a brand or a name, a name for myself. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. Um, so how does it, let me ask you a question. How does it, uh, what are some of the ways that you can find uh, sponsors as a fighter? I've always admired, uh, in, in another life for me, I would be a fighter. <laughs> I've always admired uh, everybody who boxes and wrestles and you know, my, my core is wrestling, but I've always also wondered, you know, once you get more established, the business of working with sponsors, like is, is right. How, how does that kind of work? You, you actually compete, right? Different. I used to, I used, used to, to, yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll get to that in a second, but, <laughs> uh, b back to your question, um, the sponsorships, right? You want yeah. to know how one get, how one gets sponsorships or what are, yeah. What are some ways, you know, I'm sure you know people, but also, you know, I'm sure you have uh, people hitting you up, you know, Hey, let me, you know, let me sponsor you. Let me put my logo on your, on your shorts or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, what our first, like I said, well, first you, you have to create an, as a fighter, as a athlete, uh -huh. you have to create a name for yourself, a brand. Like I'm a brand. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not just Mike Sanchez, the boxer. I'm Mr. Yeah. Mike, the professional boxer who, you know, has a certain personality who thinks a certain way who uh, maybe attracts a certain type of crowd 
Like I'm a brand. Right. I'm a brand. Yeah. And that's how, that's how I started seeing myself not too long ago. Um, I'm a brand. So I feel like the sponsors who reach out to me, uh, in a way have to like what they see about me, or maybe they see their business or their brand that they, they see the similarities with the type of person I am, you know, mm-hmm. like if they have a certain, um, how would I say aura or a certain essence they want to portray in their brand and they feel like I have that, then they'll yeah. reach out to me. For example, I'm a, I, I feel like, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't say intelligent, but I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a type of person who likes to think outside of the box. You know, I like to think yeah. for myself and, you know, I'm not just a fighter. Um, I'm more about, you know, not more about, but I'm, I'm also about, you know, learning about human behavior and the psychology behind the yeah. actual fighting. Like there's a lot of psychology that goes behind the actual skill of fighting. And I feel like I incline on, on, on a lot of, a lot, a lot of that too. Uh, for the people who follow me on social media, I know you see me on social media. Like that's kind of like what I try to portray. Cause that, that's who I am. I'm not just yeah. about the actual, uh, physical, the physical, uh, aspect of the sport of boxing, but I also enjoy the psychological factor that that's behind it. So maybe yeah. someone who, who has a brand that this is just like a, I don't know, a, a made up brand, maybe someone who has a business that's, uh, in regards to, I don't know, they're promoting some type of supplement that does good for the brain, you know, mm. or some shit like that. Then they, they might, yeah, you know, they, they might, yeah. they might like my, my personality <laughs> or what I represent. They might hit me up like, Hey, you know, I want to sponsor you for, for my product, you know? Cause they kind of yeah. see, they kind of see the, the type of person I am is someone who would, um, be aligned or represent that brand better for them. Right. 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 Yeah, you're not, I, you're not going to get, um, a fighter who, who let's say maybe he's just all about the fighting. Maybe he's just kind of like a street, a street fighter type of guy. Uh, you know, promoting or uh, being sponsored by, I don't know, like, I don't know, man, just some random, like some random shit, like, I don't know, like some, some pillow yeah. brand, I don't know, you know, just something yeah. random I've seen in my room, like, you know, yeah, yeah. You, it, it's not the same, you know, you're not, you yeah. can't compare like tough with like soft, you know, so yeah. they have to be aligned, the fighter and the brand have to be aligned, so I feel like mm-hmm. that's where sponsors that's what spo- that's what sponsors do to, you know, to find the right athletes to uh, uh-huh. to, to promote their their business, their brand. Right, right. Yeah, because it's kind of mutual, right? Like the like you said, the fighter's personality, uh, their uh, their performance, uh, what they represent outside of the ring. That's all going to be part of at what that stick for the sponsor, right? So of course. that has to be all all packaged and, up. And that's better for the fighter too. The fight <laughs> the the fighter yeah. feels more uh more content, you know, more um he he hope opens himself more to the idea of of being sponsored by that brand cuz he feels like there's a connection there. Yeah. So you know, so it's that's good for both of them. Well, I'll tell you what, man, since I've started a uh, um so I I knew about you maybe what, what was it back 2019? Um, How'd you know about me? It was it was at that um, you did photograph you from one of my fights, right? Yeah, the one in Reno. Yeah, yeah, that was uh I I had heard about you. I had looked because I do my research before I go to these events, and I I had uh, I figure out you know a little bit about the fighters and their names and their social media and such. But um. I had a, a bet with a buddy of mine. I was like, yeah, Mike's going to knock this guy out, man. Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's no way he's going to lose. And I forget how you won. If it was a knockout or what, but there was a, there was um, a knockdown. I knocked him down in the uh, third right, round, yeah. but uh, I ended up just winning by unanimous decision. Yeah. 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 But uh, I forget where I was going with that, but <laughs> um, photography, you do photography, right? Yeah. So is that, is that like, okay. So 
tell us a bit about, more about that, man. Is that like something you've always been into? Yeah, you know, so there's a lot of parallels with, uh, oh, I remember where I was going now, but no, we'll get back to that. But uh, there's a lot of parallels with, uh, I thought about this the other, last week with your uh, recent injury and then my injury last year or two years ago. Um, I was I've always been that, into. Yeah, I, I yeah, didn't know I'm, you were injured. I was lo- I was looking at your uh, your Instagram and I seen that man that uh, something about your leg, right? Yeah, I tore. Uh, I, I basically sprained my left ankle and I tore, like except for my Achilles, I tore like every ligament in that area. And uh, yeah. if if you know about ligaments, I, I didn't know, but I learned that they almost have zero blood flow, so they they take for they take years to heal up or. And they don't really heal up. They just kind of scar over, right? But Yeah, it's scar tissue is created. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I've, I've always enjoyed photography. And then I've always, uh, since I was a freshman in high school, so that was like 14, I started wrestling in uh, in high school. And I wrestled all my four years in high school. And I wrestled a little bit as a walk-on in college. And then at that time, I was dealing with a shoulder injury. Uh, my Both of my shoulders kept dislocating, so that kind of stopped my, my college wrestling a little bit, but, uh, from then until now, the, the sport of wrestling and, and even boxing, man, like I, I never really competed in boxing, but boxing was my true, uh, first, uh, love for combat sports as I was a kid. Um, like that boxing and wrestling combined, um, they had such an impact on me that I started staying engaged with the sport of wrestling at least. And I started helping coaching. I started uh, going to these events to watch. I stayed really engaged in the sport. Um, And then when I got injured that I really couldn't. So up until then, I was still kind of practicing rolling around with kids and stuff and some of the athletes, but up until uh, I injured my ankle, I thought, well, shit, man, I can't like, I can't do anything anymore. (laughs) So like, what am I going to do with my time? And I, and I always have a bunch of hobbies going on. So, that really wasn't the problem, but yeah, something to, uh, I always need something that I'm learning. I'm always trying to challenge myself. Um, so what filled the void was photography. So I started kind of building my brand, kind of like what you were talking earlier. I started with like zero followers and kind of pushing my product out there, getting better at sports photography. Cause it's a little different than just regular photography. How so? Um, well with, with sports photography, the way I look at it is, it's three, it's three things. You have to, you have to know the sport. You can't just go out and start taking pictures of, of, you know, people on the mat or people in the boxing ring or, um, cause you, you want to tell a story with your photography, right? So mm-hmm. that's why I do my research on people like you or whoever I'm photographing, right? I, I see their, their record, their past fights, how they're, what are their tendencies as they're walking into the ring onto the mat? Um, how do they celebrate, you know, what are their tendencies? So I can capture those moments, right? In, in real time. And then with sports photography, um, this is where the technical side of photography comes in. Um, you have to adjust a lot. There's different settings for really fast actions, like things like shutter speed, um, how wide the uh, opening, the aperture is. So those, those are different than if you're taking like a portrait where you're really not worried about speed. And so mm-hmm. it becomes a little more challenging with photography on the technical side of things. Um, so those are two things that I kind of value with photography is knowing the sport and then the technical side of things. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of how they're different with, with photography in a studio, you know, you have all the lighting that you need. Um, you can tell the subjects to put, reposition themselves and Hey, stand over here and let me take the perfect shot. So you have all the time in the world, right. With, with sports and boxing in particular, like you don't have time at all, man. Like if you miss that knockout, you know, obviously it's not going to happen again. So you miss your shot. Right. right. Let me, let me ask you this question or do you like, for example, for like a boxing event, or any combat sport event, do you go like before the actual show starts and the fights start? Do you, are you able to, or do you go to, you know, the fight scene, wherever the ring is at or the cage or the mats and do you like test, take a couple pictures and test out like maybe like maybe the lighting or, or different angles. Do you do that at all? Yeah. Are you, are you, are you able to do that? Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, I've been at some of, some of the smaller local events where they, they don't let you do that. Um, either they're not set up yet or, you know, it's a, a smaller events. They're not that organized, but um, when you're doing stuff for like uh, ESPN or top rank or with wrestling, you know, you have USA wrestling, the uh, Olympic, 
committee, those, those, those groups of people, they're very, very organized. So they actually have time slots where media, including photographers, can go in and set, set up. And so set up means, uh, um, you know, every photographer has a different agenda on their mind. Um, you know, some guys are there for uh, a specific athlete. Some people are there uh, for all athletes and they're just gonna take little snippets of every athlete here and there for the local newspaper, whatever. Um, so depending that, on what they're doing there, is that you? Oh, no, nah, man, I'm, no? I'm not trying to do it for money yet. So I'm still doing it for the love of the sport and the hobby. So I try to capture like what's all my favorite athletes, you know, who I'm there going to see. Cause one of the other reasons I started is because like, I was already going to a lot of these events just out of the pure love for the sport. Right. So I was paying my travel and my ticket. And sometimes I'd go with my brother or some friends and like, Hey, let's go watch this fight or let's go watch this wrestling tournament. Um, so I thought to myself, Hey, I'm injured. Can't, I can't practice these, uh, sports anymore. If, if I'm already paying for these, let me see if I can build up my photography enough. So that now I'm invited to these events and then I can go. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I've had the opportunity to make money off of it, but the times that I've made really good money off of it, I didn't enjoy it. Mm. I, I was always being told what to do. Like, like, hey, I'd go catch this athlete and stay stay on this map for the next couple hours. Like, you, you, we want to see what's going on there. And then meanwhile, the guy I really came to see is like wrestling behind me and I, I can't watch him. Mm. You know, so that's... uh. Fortunately, I have my regular job that can kind of keep me going, right? But uh, if I was depending on photography to make money, uh, I think I would, I think I'd get to a point where I wouldn't enjoy it because I would have to uh, cater to other people's agendas that aren't necessarily mine, mm -hmm. you know? So um, you, you have a, you have a pretty big following on your, on your Instagram, particularly man for uh, your photography. How, how'd you, uh, how were you able to get such a big following? Was there, Dude, a, that was a, it, it was that it was a grind. Life? Was it just putting out content? What was it, man? Tell us the secret, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I'll, I'll tell you, but I, like, it was a grind, man. I've told this to a few like up and coming photographers and like, they're like, nah, let me see if I can find another way. <laughs> but, um, so like I said, it all started when I was injured, right? So. I went to my first, uh, let me see. I reached out to a high school in, uh, in, uh, Bellflower. It's a St. John Bosco high school. Okay. You know, you might know where that is, mm -hmm. uh, near, 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 just North of Long Beach. Um, and they were going to have a summer camp for kids with a high level wrestler that, uh, I, I liked and I still, I still like. So, I reached out to the organizers of, of that tournament or that camp at the high school. And I said, Hey, can I just, can I just show up and shoot pictures there? And my goal was to take pictures of this one guy and the whole team and start pumping them out in social media. And I remember I had these, uh, uh, cards, these business cards that I made at the last minute. I hand wrote in some of them and I printed out some of them on my printer and I showed up there with my little camera. Um, and I'm like, you know, you said in one of your podcasts that like you're very introverted. Like I'm, I'm super introverted too, man. And whenever I'm going to go out and put myself out there in these settings, like I take hours ahead of time and think about, and I rehearse it in my mind. And sometimes it hurts me because I overthink it, but that time it went really well. So I started introducing myself to the coaches. I met this wrestler that I went there to go see. Also, I introduced myself to the parents and I said, Hey man, my name's Ed Sanchez. Here's my card. Um, I'm going to be shooting some pictures today. If you want uh, any of them, you know, just hit me up. Um, here's my website. Here's my Instagram. Um, you know, shoot me a follow. I'd really appreciate it. That was my whole spiel. Right. And I did that about, you know, five or 600 times that for that whole weekend. And I got a few followers <laughs> at, at that <laughs> I, time. How big was your following over a thousand? No, it was about 50. Oh, yeah. Early new. Early new. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This, so this was like, this was the summer of 2019 and I got injured in March. So I was barely like kind of gimping along. I remember like trying to run to different, uh, uh, competitions. Right. And I was, I was like, Oh shit, I'm still injured. I can't, I gotta be careful. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, but, um, did you, did you have surgery remember, on that, on that injury or no? No, I didn't, man. They, they recommended no surgery. They recommended to just let it heal and see how, how, how it 
heals up. And if I'm not at, a, at near 100% within a couple of years, then they'll go in and check, and maybe repair some stuff. But I'm pretty good now, man. I'm back to doing sprints and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm back to pretty much 100%. How long has that been? Over a year? Uh, no, man. It's been uh, two and a half years now. So it was uh, well, March of 19. You, when when did you feel close to 100%? Just oh, uh, I would say earlier this year, maybe uh, maybe springtime. Mm. Yeah, because I remember before then, I would have to really warm up my un my ankle and uh, uh, and 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 think about it before I start to, for a run, right? And, and maybe even start off at the other foot. Um, but I remember in the summertime, I wasn't even thinking about it, man. I felt so good, uh, and I went for a sprint. And after I was done, I was like, oh, I didn't even have to think about it, man. I, and and I checked my ankle, and it was fine. And then the next day, I did it again. And I did I didn't have to warm it up that much, so. I thought, man, maybe I can just, as long as I'm careful about it, I'm basically back to normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but he also told me that, uh, if I was a professional athlete, you know, maybe like yourself or some of the, like he gave me the example of basketball players that happens a lot to them. They wouldn't even bother with the rehab because they need, they got to get back on the, in the ring or on the court. Right. So they would just go in and repair it right away. Right. Yeah. It was my situation, man. I actually, I, I, I got yeah. surgery done on my, on my shoulder. It was, a. Uh... It was a pretty bad injury, man. They had to go in there and reconstruct the whole fucking, you know, uh, uh, a joint. And uh, it was, they tried to do it as, um, as clean as, how would I say? Mm. The best technology possible for an athlete like I am. Yeah. So uh, I'm getting good results, man. I feel better. Uh, we're doing rehab. Uh, just taking it step by step. It's been three months since I got the surgery done. So they gave me a six to seven month uh, healing period to I can basically get back to, you know, to normal while it's close yeah. to it. Did, how did you injure it, man? I don't know that I ever uh, saw that on your, on your social media or anything. I had a motorcycle accident. Oh, well, not man. motorcycle. I was off-roading. Not motorcycle. Yeah. A motor. Yeah. I was off-roading, man. And, um. Uh, I was at a sand dune out here in, um, you know, you know, um, uh, Inland Empire here in uh, California. Yeah. You know the area? I was out in, uh, kind of close by Indio in, uh, Desert yeah. Springs, I think. There were some sand dunes over there. And, uh, I was off running, man. I was in a, on a quad. I was coming down a sand dune, man. I was out with my parents, with my, with my family, mm -hmm. both my parents and my, my little sister, 12 year old sister, 12 year old sister at the time. And, uh, 12. No, she was thirteen. Yeah, this was this was uh, early this year, man, in uh, January. Dang. And uh, I was coming down a sand dune, man, and I don't know what it was, man. It was kind of like those moments where everything just happens in a flash. Though, yeah. from what I remember, I was coming coming before uh, coming down before my dad, and uh, he was coming down a bit slower than me. So to avoid him, I just made a sharp turn to my right. I remember, and my wheel, my right wheel, front wheel, um, hit. I'm sorry, my left front wheel. It kind of hit like a. There's a certain name that we call this type of sand. It's just a sand that's not, not. Uh, it's you know, it's it's loose sand. You know, they ha it hasn't been yeah. you know ran it's through. Not settled. Exactly. Um, and then the wheel got stuck on there. And then last thing I remember, see, this is the question I still keep asking myself. And I don't know if I'll, I'll ever get the answer because I don't remember, man. I I don't know if I flipped over the handlebars and I fell straight on my left shoulder. Or I, I held on to the handlebars and I turned over to kind of like a sideways turn to my left. I don't know if I bring if I if I brought the uh, the ATV down with me. I don't know if that shit fell over me, man. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Yeah. But from the the seriousness of the injury, it's it's a possibility, man, because there had to be a lot of weight on that shoulder. Because for for the uh, what happened is uh, the AC joint had had ruptured, man. So the joint mm -hmm. that connects. The col the collarbone that connects to the scapula, yeah, it, it ruptured. So 
they it had to be like a lot of pressure, a lot of weight on that for it to happen. And it was a uh, it was labeled a uh, a grade five AC joint separation, so it's like the worst you could get. Shit, man. And uh, of course, I needed surgery, man. Um, so that's how I ended it, man. That's how I ended it. Uh, Bro, I was out. Tough. I was there. For, I was like, I was with the injury for like maybe three months. I didn't have the surgery right away. Mm. Uh, there was just a bunch of bullshit I had to deal with, with, with insurance and doctors and shit. Uh, but I worst. had a, yeah, man. So, uh, I fucking sorted everything out as fast as I could. And I got the surgery done like four months after I fucked it up. So, it, uh. I mean, it, it was four months that could have been, you know, um, yeah. You know, not wasted, but it is what it is now, you know? And, uh, yeah. You know, good thing I got the surgery done and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting positive results from it. So, um, yeah, it looks pretty good. Know, yeah. Just, just, you know, thinking about it honestly, uh, I'm sure I'm going to have some, some, some problems with it either now or in the future. But uh, you know, I'm 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 willing to deal with them and uh and uh, you know make ma- make the best of it, man. That's this isn't gonna um uh, derail me from from my goal, man. So yeah, you know, I'm I'm very strong minded, very positive, very practical too, man. You know, I'm I'm logical too. I I know I know I I suffered a pretty serious injury, so you know I got to take that as it is, you know, and act smart and like I said, um, try to make the best of the with what the injury I have, man. Just be smart about it. And uh of course heal it up as best as I can. Yeah. Well hey man, with uh you know back back to one of the things that I when, when I forgot where I was going. <laughs> uh when I saw that you had this podcast out, uh for me something clicked. You know, I was like, all right. And then I, I also knew about your injury. So I was like, okay, this this is the type of guy that's uh not going to let an injury stop him from advancing and, and challenging himself and reaching certain goals. Right. You took advantage of that downtime and created this podcast, which, you know, it's growing. Um, and I thought back to my situation where, you know, I was like, all right, I'm not going to let this, this foot, this foot injury just derail me, man. Let me, let me see if I can, uh, do something with it. And here, you know, here we are with my photography that's blowing up and, that's one of the things, you know, all, all this adversity that, you know, you and me and everybody have, goes through in life, you know, if you look at it on the bright side and uh, take advantage of what you're presented with in the moment, like you're doing things that you would have never done otherwise. Like I would have never focused on this photography. It would have stayed as a low key hobby for me, you know, if I didn't get injured. Um, but now I'm back to almost 100 percent with my foot and as a consequence, I have this photography thing that I could eventually, hopefully just rely on when I retire or something. Right. It's like, it was a blessing in disguise, I guess, you know? Right. I I wouldn't have forced myself to have done that. And so I see like some of that with your, with your podcast too. So it's pretty refreshing, man. Absolutely, man. I feel like it's a mentality. I feel like that right there is a mentality, man. Like a lot of people can't really relate to that to this type of situation a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't or maybe aren't able to see you know or make something good of whatever might have might have happened in their life a lot of people yeah i don't know man i feel like it's uh, a lot of people are pessimistic man totally a lot of people are pessimistic i don't feel like they uh i i feel like they're i feel like it's pessimism and i feel like it's um emotional strength as well mental strength a lot of people don't have that man um yeah. and it's a skill we can build just like we can build get bigger muscles and yep. build all sorts of shit man mental strength and emotional strength because i feel like emotional strength is not talked about either yeah. emotional strength is just as important as mental strength emotional strength meaning you're able to control your emotions. You're able to acknowledge your emotions, not sure. suppress them, and knowing how to control them. Not your emotions controlling you. And I feel like you have to be emotional, emotionally strong, especially as a combat sports athlete, 
to uh to succeed in the sport man if you oh, let the sure. emotions for example of the crowd get to you of the noise the emotions of fight day the emotions of uh the pressure of of uh of just everything the setting it's gonna affect the way you perform man oh you yeah be, you could be the most skilled fighter out there you know, we hear about those uh, those sparring champions, right? We have fighters who are great when they're sparring, man. They're like, damn, that guy over there sparring, you see him? You know, with the, the gym, black, right? with, with the gym, with the black head gear yeah. on? Damn, he looks nice. Damn, he's a future world champion. A fucking star, man. A fucking star. He's got everything. Everything. But fight day comes. You know, he's walking to the ring. You know, he's under those bright lights. You got the fucking announcer there announcing his name. You got his family, his people watching yeah. on TV. You know, his girlfriend fucking ringside watching him. A lot of people can't yep. take that pressure, man. A lot of people yeah. can't take that pressure. And they fold. They fold, man. man. They fold. They they fold. And, you know, all those skills, all that talent went down the drain. And... Yeah. You know, with I don't I don't think it's a it's a people don't see it as a skill. Some people just think like, oh, well that guy just has it. Well, maybe he does or maybe he doesn't. But what he has, you can have as well. You just have to be willing to work for it, work for it yeah. every motherfucking day, man. Yeah. Every day. How do you do that? By challenging yourself, by putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, by doing shit you don't want to do. By doing yeah. shit you hate, but still doing it, because you know there's a greater benefit in the future. That's how you. That's a. That's how you build that muscle, man. By by not feeling comfortable. That's all it is. Yep. And a lot of people are not willing to do that. A lot of people are play it safe. People. A lot of people think that their talent uh, is enough. That's gonna get them. your talent is only gonna get you to a certain to a certain extent, man. The rest of it is heart. The rest of it is dedication the rest of it is mental strength emotional strength it's just a scale that everybody can build but nobody's building it yep. yeah and con controlling it right yeah I, you know i feel like uh, unless you have like a mental disorder or something but everybody has it in them to have control of their mind control of their emotions and and control of their physical uh strength right like ev everybody can do it it's just People, people get too comfortable in modern society, man. And uh, and it's not you know, easy. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. Oh, but yeah. But it's possible. Yeah, for sure, man. Very possible. I think it was, uh, you know, what one of the, um, I, l I listened to a lot of podcasts. And uh, one, of, one of the podcasts I was listening to recently was uh, talking about some, uh, and I've read a bunch of books on this too, but. You know, back if, if you rewind time, like maybe 10,000 years ago, people were forced with challenging situations, adversity, like almost constantly every day, right? You know, they had to go hunt for food and they had, they were getting attacked, tribes fighting each other. Um, re, every resource they needed to survive was scarce and it was valued. And you didn't need to go to a gym to train your mind and your muscles, right? Like it was just part of life, man. But you fast forward to now, like people uh, can get basically any kind of food they want <laughs> at any time of the day with freaking DoorDash or they just walk to the corner store, whatever. Like there's no struggle behind that. Um, and so now, you know, people resort to sport and the gym and, you know, to build, build that mental strength. So. Uh, I guess my, my point is back to emphasize your point is that we all got it in ourselves, you know, like genetically, all of our ancestors had had the capability to overcome that. And we have it too. We just, we've grown soft, man, I think. And a lot has to do you know? with, with how, you know, society is set up, man. Like society really how, how you described it, how everything, how we can get everything, you know, quick as shit. Mm -hmm. Um, it really, it makes us dependent on that shit, man. Like it doesn't, it doesn't allow us to work hard for stuff anymore. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and we have to be aware of that shit, man. We have to be aware of that shit that all this new technology, although it may be great and of great benefit for a lot of things, it also is bad and for the building of a strong mind, for the building of hard work, for the building yeah. of you know, building that grit, man. You know, uh, it's if it's easy, then you're probably not gaining much from it, man. All the shit that's yeah. worthy in your life is gonna be fucking hard, and that's, that's just a reality. And some of us don't don't like it, but that's the reality, man. If if you right now or anybody listening is going through an easy time in their life, yes, enjoy it, but just know that that easy life is making you mm. soft. Yeah, it's derailing you from becoming a stronger person. And, yeah. you know, just know that, um, you know, like the saying, it's better to be uh, a warrior in the garden than being oh something like that. it's better to be a warrior warrior in, in a garden than being a gardener in, in, in war, some shit like that. You know, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. in other words. You know, you have to be prepared for the worst. And I know it yeah. may sound like maybe something you don't want to hear. But yeah, man, like it's just reality. We have to be logical. Sometimes life is the just shit's going to go down and you have, you have to be prepared for the worst. That doesn't mean don't don't enjoy yeah. the good in your life. But just be prepared for the worst. For the worst. That's how I see my life, man. Yeah, um, yeah for sure, man. I'm coming to the understanding that that life is, you know, a combination of of ups and downs. And if I'm doing good, if I'm in a position that I might uh, uh, identify as an up in my life, then you know I enjoy it because I know that that roller coaster is gonna come down eventually. Yeah. And I'm aware that just that's just part of life, man. If we didn't have both sides of the equation, then it wouldn't be life. We yep. have to have both, man. We have to have both. And I feel like if, if you, like I said, if you are aware of that, you kind of uh, better plan your life or better, yeah, you be, you have a better strategy to your life. Like I said, if you're doing good, then just know that sometimes, you know, it, it it's going to be bad, you know, and eventually. Yeah. And, and the opposite as well. If you're going through a hard time, you feel like you're giving up or you feel like can't go any further. And just know eventually there's going to be some good in your life. So yeah, for sure, man. That's the beauty of it, man. You know, it's it's the rain and, and the sunshine. I say this a lot in, in, in my podcast episodes, man. I feel like life is a combination of, of opposites. That's what makes yeah. life, if you think about it. Yeah, like uh, 50 Cent said, there's no joy without pain. <laughs> it wouldn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Well, at least but, you wouldn't you wouldn't know the you wouldn't understand the value of yeah. joy. You know yeah. the the happiest people or the people that are more joyful, most likely they've been through hell. They've been through some serious shit, and they able they're able to appreciate the good times better. Yeah. You know, sometimes, uh, especially here in America, like a lot of us are entitled. You know. We cry about the smallest shit. Yeah. Uh, but if you compare it to the lives of other people, like, we truly are blessed. Like, we're crying about shit that really doesn't matter. Really exactly, does, yeah. Really doesn't matter at all, bro. And, uh, yep. but I was I just feel, thinking about that today. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, what were you thinking? Yeah. Uh, I was running this morning, and I, I thought, uh, I remember hearing somebody somewhere complain as I was running by. Somebody was complaining about, um, by Joe Biden. <laughs> and right. like, I overheard their conversation. And I was and I, I remember thinking like, and then the day before I had just seen something on, uh, on TV, this, uh, sh the show I was watching about uh, life in, uh, it was a documentary on a tribe in Africa, right? Now, I remember thinking, I don't care how divided this country is right now. You want to talk about Trump or Biden, you want to talk about homelessness in LA, you want to talk about liberals re republicans whatever every single one of those demographics i just mentioned has it better than a war-torn third world country with under civil war right now Definitely. like we to your to your point we forgot about that man like we 
we're sheltered, man. And every single person, you know, we're, we're in the, in the stage of the world, this country is in the top percentage of a lifestyle, you know? I totally agree with him, man. A lot, a lot of people, a lot of people need to get in, in, into that perspective because it's, it's a serious one. But let me ask you this, man. That being said, should us Americans, should us people living here in America right now today in 2021, should we ignore the fact that all that shit is going on due to that perspective you just mentioned? No, I don't think we should ignore it, but I think we are approaching it the wrong way because we don't have that perspective in my opinion. So for example, the, you know, I mentioned earlier, the media is not helping at all in my opinion. Um, you know, if you look at Fox news, they give you something completely opposite than CNN on the same topic. And it's like, all right, who do you believe? So I've, I've kind of evolved to get my news from kind of alternative sources and including Fox and CNN. And, and then I kind of make my own judgment, you know, my own perspective. Mm-hmm. And again, I learned that from, you know, living in different regions of the country, right? That kind of taught me that the, the truth is somewhere in the middle usually. So anyway. Exactly. Yeah. There's a, so, there's, you know, <clears throat> there's fucking, so, yeah, go ahead. No, no, but like back to your question, like um, the country seems to be like divided in a hard line, right? Like everybody, you if you meet a random person who you don't know on the street, like, and you begin to talk to them because they don't know you well, they'll probably tell you that they are completely Republican or completely Democrat. Mm-hmm. Um, if you haven't gotten the sense of them already just by talking to them, but, but that's, that's how I feel. I feel that everybody's bucketing themselves into like over here, or over there. When in reality, most people are like in the middle, man, but that agenda is not being pushed out. We, we are more united than the media makes it out to be. But they're not pushing that because I think you said in one of your podcasts, right? Like you, unity is not going to make money for media. They, they, they need these headlines. They need this clickbait. They need, they need you to see, oh shit, there's a riot over here. Let me click on that. Like that's, that's what makes money to them. But in, if, if you, again, back to my example of, if you talk to somebody on the street, just a random person, they're not going to agree with a hundred percent that bite of everything that Biden does. They're going to disagree with a lot of Trump's policies. And I think that's most people. I, I, I can't, I don't know anybody and I've never met anybody who is a hundred percent left and a hundred percent right. Most people are in the middle, you know, it's and damn I, near, I think that, it's, that, it's, it's damn near impossible to be a hundred percent left or right, man. Like, yeah, there's just so many fucking laws and different you know, philosophies and way of running the country economically. And it's just, it's real fucking hard to be all on one side. A lot of people are in the middle, like you said, they're fucking moderators, you know, they're right in yeah. the middle. Um, But yeah, man, it's, it's that, I think it's that, that division they're trying to create, man, which is not healthy. I feel like a lot of people really, you can't really sit down and have a conversation like you and I are having right now, man. Like it's yeah. really hard to have a conversation with the stranger and put their egos aside and put their political views political views aside and just have a normal conversation conversation. That's real, real hard to do right now in this time yeah. and age. And I feel like we need to push that a lot more. Cause at the end at the end of the day, we need to see the individual individual as, you know, as a human being, regardless of whatever, you know, yeah. uh, your standpoint on on whatever you know politics is man like like we're people man we've forgotten how to deal with people yeah you know it's just i feel like that's where we should start man like we gotta remember that we're just everybody's just people man and people are gonna think differently and um yeah. but yeah man it's just it's, it's it's those two opposites man those completely two different opposites that's that's making that's the issue i believe and yeah. and everybody's just trying to pull through the side man it's it's that's why a lot of people don't like talking about politics man because it's really just one group that's trying to 
win. It's basically a competition, bro. That's all it is, man. Yeah. We're, you know, it, 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 it's a competition. It you know, it's... Uh, I don't know much about politics. Um, I try to, you know, get into... get in. I want to say get into it. But, of course, with everything going on in America right now, why wouldn't you want to be involved? You know, we only live yeah. here. You know, we yeah. only live exactly, here, yeah. so... You that, should know, yeah. I, that's how I see it, man. I don't, I don't, I don't look into it from a damn. When I, I want to know everything, you know. I want to know. I want to know how fucking all this shit runs. That's fucking. That's a full time job, man. But I do want to know how what's going on out there is gonna affect my life. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Gonna, it's gonna affect your life, you know. So we have to be somewhat informed, and uh, you know the people voting as well, man. I, like most of them don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're just voting because yeah. their neighbor fucking voted left or their neighbor their neighbor voted right. Dude, really, that that's what it, the shit that's out of me, man. That's really what it is, man. People don't know yeah. what the fuck they're doing. And nope. the people up top, the politicians know that. That that yeah. that's why they play the game the way they play it, man, because it's not about knowing. It's just about what gets more attention. And the media knows that too, man. Of course, man. It's fucking. Yeah. Uh, it's all a fucking show. Yeah. It's always been a show, but uh, yeah. We, I think, technology in that way has helped us understand <clears throat> what's really going on with politics. Yeah. Before we wouldn't really know what would be going on. Everything was like cl behind closed doors, you know. Now yeah. with fucking social media, people are able to record, and people are able, um, you know, real journalists and shit. Um, yeah. Well, journalists, I feel, I believe there's always been, you know, journal journalists out there, but now those journalists can really um, spread out that information, yeah. you know, through different ways, you know, blogs, fucking social media, YouTube, everywhere. So that's, that's, I feel like that's good, man, because yeah, for sure, we, the, you know, the people, the citizens of, of, of the United States can, uh, can better be informed, man, like actually make a decision that's best for us not for yeah. their our neighbor not for them yeah. but for us you know yeah it's good but and that's what we're that's when we're seeing that this whole fucking this whole fighting because we're able to we're informed now you know so we can actually fight back now with yeah. facts with facts yeah yeah now, i think that to your point earlier i like what you said about uh you know, having a conversation with someone, right? Because right now that competition you mentioned, that, that game that the both sides are playing, all it is is on social media, it's like these Twitter sound bites, these 30 second sound bites on, on CNN or Fox. And uh, you get a Facebook post here and there from the candidates or whatever. Uh, but that tells you nothing about the person, you know, like, like right now, me and you are talking and we've been talking for a, about an hour. Yeah. I've learned more about you, like exponentially more about you than I did just reading your social media. Like, and now, now I feel like I actually know you and, um, most people, and, they and, feel and, like they know somebody based on their the Joe Biden's Instagram or Trump's Instagram is like, you don't know them, man. You know, the actor playing. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, you gotta you gotta have a long form conversation and like really get to know the per person you know ask them questions and get get to see how they talk how how do they react to your questions and do they you know are they do they lean in to talk are they listen are they listening to understand are they listening to fight back you know what what are they like man what are they how are they going to behave in office what's also key i believe is <clears throat> both individuals have to be open to have the conversation like they yeah. have to come, they have to come in with an open mind. Like, you know, they have to leave their beliefs and their point of view to the side and really just listen. Yeah. Listen and input, listen and input. I feel like that's the beginning of something better coming to a better understanding, you know? Yep. Uh, put the ego aside a bit, put your, put your, your, uh, your political views, your, just everything aside, I'm not saying yeah. stop believing in them or stop representing them, but just kind of listen to what the other person has to say. I feel like that's I feel like that's where we're fucked up, man. 
Now people don't yeah. listen anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, people yeah. don't people don't listen anymore, yeah. man. That's a skill that's been lost. Nobody wants to listen. And, it's hard. It's harder than most people think. And yeah. people's people's attention span has has lessened. You know, people yeah. on on social media, if it's if it's longer than fifteen seconds, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, know? they're done. Yeah, like they're done. Like you got fifteen yeah. seconds, and and a lot and. The political parties know that as well. Like you said, they have the smaller clips, all that small shit. Yeah. Within know you know it. thirty seconds, and boom, they just got they just get whatever they're trying to promote in that short time span. Yeah. And you boom, they did their job. You know, yeah. like you said, but we don't we don't know what the fuck who they are or or all the extra shit. We just know a fucking thirty second clip. We seen a fucking yeah. Trump talking shit, exactly. you know, or just shit yeah. like that, yeah. you know. That's yeah, all it's it insane, is. man. Really so you know, back crazy. to your back to your to your question earlier, like if we if people if more people recognize everything you just said, that hey man, these these sides are playing us. These media agencies are playing Instagram's freaking stories. You know, those are fifteen seconds long. You called it. Mm -hmm. They're catered to these sound bites. Like everything around you is catering to these unrealistic perceptions of left and right. So if people realize that, then to answer your original question, then we would be able to have this perspective that as a country, dude, we, we got it pretty fucking good, man. You know, and, and of course, you know, there, there, we have issues, but uh, that we can resolve then if we, if we put ourselves in that mindset that like, Hey, we're all more similar than we think, you know, we we all want the best for each other. We all want good education. We all want uh, basic necessities. Like we're very similar, man. But the, like we're not being pushed in that direction. We're we're being pushed this way, and that that bothers the shit out of me. Like sometimes I lose sleep over it. To be honest, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's really a big issue, man. It's a bigger issue than what people think it is. Yeah, it's a big issue, but it's sometimes it's seen like a joke. There's yeah. um there's a saying do you speak Spanish? Sí. Yeah. Yep. There's this, claro que there, sí. <laughs> there's a saying in Spanish that goes Entre broma y broma la verdad se asoma. Which sí. which translated in English is you know, with every joke the truth appears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with every joke the truth yeah, appears. So you hear fucking, you know, politicians or the media joking around, joking about shit, or just laughing about certain topics. But they're in a way promoting a truth, but they're trying to kind of lessen the impact of it. That's really what yeah. it is, man. Like yeah. when you joke around about shit, little by little, you're trying to lessen, you're trying to fucking. Uh, let the other person put their guard down, and then you're gonna strike them with something different. Yeah, that's all. That's all fucking. That's a fucking psychological game, man. Yeah, you know, it's a psychological kind of like a, game, like, like boxing, right? You know, you you, you throw a feint, and then the yeah. guy puts his guard down, and then you and then you cross him, like right? It's like you know, <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what it is, man. It's <clears> it's. <throat> I feel like that that's what's going on too, in in, in yeah. America right now, man. Psychological warfare, man. Like they're using fucking smarts to defeat us but we're just too yeah. dumb to recognize it man and i say yeah. we like we as in like the society you know um because yeah. we're too caught up in all in different shit man like everything everything is a is all this shit's been planned man <laughs> yeah like you know <laughs> like you know what i'm saying like all this shit that's going on right now has been planned mm-hmm and not, 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 I'm not talking like in a fucking conspiracy theorist aspect of it. Like, really, if you if you take a look at it, man, you know the ga the government wants the power, man. Of course, that's that's what they want. They want the power, and you know you're not gonna strike the enemy or the rival when they're strong. You know you gotta weak you gotta weaken them first. How do you do that? Yeah. By fucking give giving them malnutrition by fucking fucking with their mental state with you know pharmaceutical drugs 
and social media and addictions to caffeine and technology and being dependent a whole a whole mess of shit like like people don't see that but all that shit affects us as humans man like it it trains us and indoctrin indoctrinates us to feel and think a certain way and be a, a, a certain way really that's that's all it is and you know we're being weakened man we just don't realize it we we feel like we're 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 uh becoming smarter and stronger but we're really we're just being weakened man we're, we're becoming dependent of a lot of shit and yeah you know um i'm uh i'm guilty as well man like to start off you know just having a phone social media man everybody in fucking america i don't care who you are you've owned a motherfucking phone yeah dude last I'm week i seen a fucking homeless fucking on the phone texting and shit <laughs> like like everybody owns a phone man and that right there in itself is an addiction man uh yeah. it's an addiction that's really what it is man um you know, I think I feel like that's that's a big issue. Not not the phone, but just becoming dependent on a lot of shit. And yeah, yeah. sometimes it's out of our control, you know, because if if we're not if we're not up to date with all that shit, then we we really can't function in society. Yeah, and they know that, man. So that's what I'm saying. It, it's the plan. Like we're just dependent on a lot of shit right now, man. And yeah, and yeah, you're right. Just dependent on a lot of shit. Um. But that doesn't mean we can't work on ourselves and really work on trying to evade all that shit. Like I personally, I try to, I try to inform myself as best as I can in regards to, you know, what's going on in the world, my nutrition, my health, um, you know, I read about shit that's going to help me create better relationships with, you know, my family, my friends, yep. you know, anybody. I read about how I can better my mental state. I read about, you know, financial financial growth, you know, how to manage my money mm -hmm. better. I read about Investments. just exactly, man, like. Yeah. I just try to inform myself with the best information I can to have a better, really just a, a end product, you know, just be a better person uh, all yeah. around, man. I feel like, and I feel like a lot of people are not doing that. Yeah. Uh, at least the people around me, I mean, I can't speak for all of that. That's, at, least, at least the people around me that I see are not doing that, but it's because they're following, they're too caught up in the plant. In the plan of, you know, being distracted of all that shit. We're just addicted to a lot accurate. of stuff. What's that? I would say that's accurate, your your assessment of, like, not just people around you. But I, my opinion also is, like, most people are caught up in that. Yeah. And like I said, the solution to that is just inform yourself. Yeah. I think we're addic Go ahead. No, it, it goes back to... uh you know, we have, we have so many uh, luxuries at our disposal here that um, <clears throat> there's a real danger in a lot of people. You know, I don't, I don't think I fall into this bucket because I'm aware of it, but a lot of people are not aware that they're taking too much of these luxuries in excess, like too much, too much coffee, too much, like too much access to quick, easy coffee in their kitchen, right? Too much too much access to information on their phone. Like it's, it's right there in front of them. Um, too much television, television is like right there in front of you too, too much, too much of these, uh, like too much candy or sugar, whatever, you know, you have all these tasty foods in your fridge or whatever, but like, that's, it's too much excess. And um, all of the technology, all of our access to all these things these days, if they're not taken in excess, they're very beneficial. They're very good. Like, you know, we have access to all the information of the world, basically, in our phone that we can access at any time. That's that's awesome. That's great. But it can also be taken in excess, right? You know, we have access to uh, 
you know, a cheesecake or something with, you know, you talk, mentioned the DoorDash app earlier. Um, that's great once in a while, you know, you want to reward yourself well, once a week or whatever. But again, it get in excess, like it's bad, man. And the same thing with all the other examples, like, so I, I've kind of developed a routine myself to kind of make myself aware of that stuff. But back to your point, like people have become addicted, you know, it's too, just too much excess, man, too much easy access with no adversity to these things, man. And it's too bad. People are trying to find oh. happiness with those, with those X's, bro. That thing, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, um, man. But they ain't gonna find it, man. It's not there. <laughs> it's not there. Yeah, it's not there, man. Um, but yeah, man. It's 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 a weird, it's a weird time we're in right now in 2021, man. It's a weird, weird, weird time. Uh, but I I, I do read a lot uh in regards to like different civilizations uh, oh, yeah? that have um you know existed yeah. back in the day different ages different times and there's this cycle that always occurs man life is really just a cycle and and a cycle in the aspect of um in 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 uh to my point in, in civilizations bro uh, there's yeah. a cy- there's a cycle to them man you know they 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 rise and they get to a point a peak point that you know they they eventually fall down yes every great civilization man has fallen yeah. and will fall that's just how the cycle goes and a lot has a lot has to do with it with a lot has to do with human nature there's just yeah. certain shit we do as humans there's a certain hierarchy we work in that makes that cycle possible to to continue every single time every single yeah. time and um you know I'm aware of that I'm aware of that and uh who knows what, what part of the cycle we're in right now man I feel like I think we're in the peak or we were in the peak a few years ago it might be the time yeah. where 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 you know we're we're coming down here a little bit now from what I see man <laughs> it's not looking good for yeah. us yeah <laughs> I think if we uh the the one benefit I, I agree with what you said, man, and I know what you're talking about. But I think the one thing we have going for us in this society specifically is that we have that awareness and that history to look back on. You know, like the example, like the the the, the most prominent example I can think of uh, that, that to your point was maybe the Romans, right? Probably the, one of the one of the greatest civilizations ever. That like they achieved great things, but they fell. But I don't, from things I read, I don't know that they had a high level of awareness of and examples of previous fallen civilizations and the fact that they were heading down that path. But, and if, if they did, I'm, I may be wrong, but uh, at least we do, you know, you, most of everybody's aware of that like. No, right. That's hey, what man, makes these... us different. That's what makes us different, yeah. man. That's, I feel like we're in a, we're in a strange, but in a way special <laughs> time, man. Yeah, I mean, regardless of all this shit going on, I feel like it's it's a blessing to be alive during this during this time and age, man. Like it's yeah, it's weird, but like you said, I think I think that's what makes us different from those other civilizations. We are we have the capability of knowing, and I feel like the yeah. people before they didn't have the capability of knowing. There was yeah, no they way to recognize be informed. it, right? Yeah, man, we're just like I said, we're yeah. we're able to the information is right in front of our eyes, man. Like it's on our phone, you know, it's yeah. on our computers. It's there, and you know, I feel like them. We'll call them them. They, <laughs> they, uh, they're aware of that. That's why they're playing all this psychological warfare on us, man. That's why they're trying to dumb us down because we're able to yeah. do it, man. The, I mean, the the info is right there. But they're just trying to distract us from it. Yeah. To their benefit. Oh, for sure, man. Hey, have you seen... Uh, that reminded me of what you just said about it. There was a documentary on Netflix called The Family. Have you heard of that? No, what's it's it about? about? Uh, it's a, it talks about... Uh, this this the, the guy who made the documentary, he, he goes behind the scenes into some like really secretive 
uh, high level political fraternities uh, as he was graduating college. Um, and that's kind of how it started. But over the course of several episodes, he got to a point where he's, he realized and exposed uh, how much collusion there is between left side politics and right side politics and how they're really working together to maintain control with like their, their funky two party system, you know, like only far left and only far right. And like they, there's a lot of backdoor secret uh, activities and secret philosophies to maintain that and not introduce other parties and other perspectives. And um, like my, my political leanings are, like I said earlier, we're right in the middle. And there are very, in my opinion, qualified candidates that have come up through the years who would represent a more middle type of view and not so far right, so far left. But every time these candidates try to come in, they get immediately pushed out. And I can think of many examples and they get immediately pushed out and then you're back to just, you know, far left and far right. And, and so that documentary kind of exposed how that works and how how the goal is uh, to maintain that control, you know, and I think you were kind of alluding to that earlier. I've, that's funny you mentioned that because I've actually read like an article in regards to that not too long ago, man. Um, but back to your point, I feel like mm -hmm. I feel like that might that that may be very true, man. Because if if that were to be true, there were there would always be this constant fighting, mm -hmm. right? If 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 there was a candidate or a political party that was just right in the middle, then that would create, it would create no push, no pushback. You know, I feel yeah. like, I feel like, like I said it before, like everything runs with opposites, man. If, if there was just like a, a middle, yeah. a medium, I don't think shit would work out, man. I don't think there's got to be out. a movement. There has to be a movement. There has to be that push, that yeah. pull all the time. And that's what we have a left and a right, man. And that I feel like that's, I think that's what keeps it, keeps it alive. I don't know. What would it be if, if it would just something would come up a political view or a philosophy that would just land straight in the middle. I don't know how the yeah. world or America would react to it. It'd be something strange, something worthy of observing for sure. Something interesting. Well, I think if if I were to predict what would happen, that's a good question, man. That's 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 a question worthy of like another several hours of discussion. But if I were to predict it, you know, people would see that, you know, in my first example of moving around the country, people would see that people in California and Utah were more similar than what they were led to believe, you know, uh, whites and blacks were have more in common than what they're led to believe. Um, people who, you know, I, I grew up in a pretty ghetto, had a pretty tough upbringing, but people who grew up in a ghetto have a lot more in common than we think with people who grew up in an affluent area, you know, that we all have very, very common goals. And I think that's what we would be led to really believe. And it would bring us closer together. But then back to both of our points, you know, the media would have nothing to report on and there, there would be no movement, no, no shifting and no, no bottom lines, no more, no more greed. And, and that, that, you know, that would hurt people's, people's profits. And I don't think they're going to allow that to happen. <laughs> That's my prediction, man. I, I feel like that movement is necessary though. Although the, although the, the, the medium, the right Some in the middle yeah. sounds, sounds interesting. It sounds dangerous as well, too. Like, I don't know. It just it could sounds, be, yeah. It sounds it dangerous. Could it could be. I feel like that fighting, that push, that pullback is, is necessary all the time. You know? That would be a good case study, man, to you know, go down these rabbit holes and theorize about all these possibilities and kind of really examine what could be the outcome of each one of these possibilities. Definitely, bro. But, but, you know, that conversation is not happening anywhere. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Know, he, here's me and you, you know, two, two, two guys on a podcast in a room talking about it. But, like, the, the people who have influence aren't talking about it. It's probably not beneficial to them. <laughs> like I said, it's a, yeah. it's a dangerous 
state to be in. Yeah. Hmm, it's it's weird, man. It's weird. Well, bro, is there anything else you want to say? Um, uh, thanks for having me on, man. I really, really enjoyed it. Like I said, I've been, uh, I've, I've seen your fight before. So I've been, I was excited when I got to shoot you in photography and now I'm excited to be part of your show, man. So I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, man. Nah, bro. It's been a pleasure, man. You're a cool dude, man. Um, I need to have you back on for sure. Yeah. There's a lot more rabbit holes we can talk about for sure, man. Oh yeah. This was just the intro. <laughs> I think we just. No, I, I, the surface. for sure. I'll have you on uh, before the end of the year, for sure. I'll hit you up, man. But uh, yeah, man, thank you for coming through, man. And uh, yeah, man, I, I uh, it was nice meeting you virtually. But, you know, we made it happen. And, uh, you know, hopefully someone, somewhere in the future we can meet in person. Likewise, brother. I'll, next time I'm in Southern Cal, man, I'll, I'll hit you up. All right, man. For sure, man. Sounds good. All right, Keep bro. Grinding, brother. All right, guys, this was episode 21 from the Get Your Mind Right podcast. This was your host, Mr. Mike, and I'm going to let Mr. Ed Sanchez say goodbye as well. See you guys. I appreciate it. All right, bro. Thank you. Thank you.